I think our job and our passion is to inspire you to make better decisions, to be more thoughtful with those decisions, and to realize that if you're not feeling comfortable with this, then people like us exist purely to support you to think about the things that you might not think about. G'day guys, Ben and Simon here from Pumped on Property. Welcome to episode three of the Relaunch Podcast. How you doing, man? Oh, doing really good today. It's um, hump day, Wednesday, and for some reason, Wednesday just seems to be my day. <laughs> like It's like my day throughout the week where I just always seem to be in a good vibe and a good headspace and bloody convenient to be our uh, filming day as well. I love it, man. Like Wednesday's the perfect day for us to shoot. Um, this morning, did the Wim, Wim Hof breathing stuff. Oh, nice. Which is sick. Just the little 11 minute one on youtube did you get the tingles and the little trip going fully like i can't even believe how easily i can hold a two minute breath i know i did it on saturday for the first time in such a long time and i'm just like gosh this is cool it's just like a a shot of guarana right it's just like the biggest energy hit i love it like you just cannot not be present which i love like i meditate pretty regularly now but i think it's just such a different thing to get into your body um Then I got into a little bit of yoga and then went to the physio because I've sort of banged myself up a few weeks ago (laughs) trying to be a hero at the athletics track sprinting for the first time in a year like and just going way too hard. I think I was a bit wound up when I went out there and just went crazy and now I've hurt myself in like three spots. (laughs) 2021 Olympics, Benny's coming at you. 2021. Watch out Usain. Trying to get the under the 11 second hundred at 35. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's been good. Like I love today. I'm super excited for yeah. this podcast too. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, should be really exciting. Talking a little bit in episode three today about uh, using history to identify and achieve capital growth. Um, because the good thing is we've got decades and decades of data to look back on now to kind of get a bit of a better understanding of what's really going on in the world or Australia. Yeah, like Phil says, we can't predict the future, but we can remember the future. And what Simon and I want to talk about isn't just buying and hoping for capital growth. Mm. We're talking about a strategy that we follow personally and as a business to absolutely smash the average annual capital gain Mm. over the next 15 years on our investments. Now, I think we've talked about this in previous videos. Um, For those of you who haven't um, checked out us on YouTube or follow us on Instagram, get on there. But um, please, what we what we looked at and you know simon and i used to play a lot with compound growth calculators oh my god <laughs> one of my favorite things to do i'm like i swear my brain is now a compound growth calculator like i've looked at it that many times, <laughs> times. i swear there was three years where i just did it on every strategy session for my own fun it's so funny <laughs> like i remember learning um like future compound growth at university and things like that um in my finance course and i was just like it was so at the time just like nothing that i could relate to and the the teachers and lecturers didn't... compounding centrelink on centrelink <laughs> yeah at the really time. Work as well <laughs> they didn't really do us any favors with actually putting it into a practical framework but it didn't necessarily make sense but then when i started getting some assets under my control and started playing with these calculators i'm just like oh compound growth is great you mean if i own a million dollar property today and hold it for 50 years it's going to be worth like four million bucks oh. i'll be worth four million bucks like, <laughs> um it's but- it's really cool though but you know compound growth being one of if not the most important aspects of your property investment strategy um, so we really want to unpack what you need to focus on to ensure that you're going to get that consistency consistently and long term what i loved was when i watched uh, warren buffett's documentary which is the hbo one which is free on youtube um he was always saying to his wife because she had like a huge she wanted obviously is one of the wealthiest families in the world she had like this huge like philanthropy Mm. type thing that she wanted to do and she was constantly asking him for money and he's like no 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 wait and unfortunately she passed away before they were able to do what they did but he knew that if he if she was to wait an extra five years like 
they were going to be worth billions of dollars mm. more, which they'd be able to give away to charity versus taking the money out at that time and having a much smaller financial mm. impact. I still remember in that doco when he handed over the check to Bill Gates for the um, Bill and Belinda Foundation, I saw Bill look at him in the eye and Warren was holding the check <laughs> and he just would not let go of the money. And Bill's like trying to wrestle it out of his hand and there was just this awkward pause and then he finally gave it. <laughs> and I remember like, in another doc I've seen of the two of them, he's like, describe the differences between you guys. And he's like, um, they, someone said, if you were to walk over um, a five cent piece on the ground, Bill, what would you do? And Bill said, I'd just walk past it. And he said, what would you do, Warren? And he said, I'd, I'd pick it up and put it in my, in my money jar. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just the funniest thing I've ever heard. Like the banter, even though they're at that level, yeah. is just epic. He's such an interesting guy, Warren Buffett. Hey, I highly recommend going out there and watching that documentary. It's, um, yeah, it's cool to look into the lives of these geniuses. Yeah, he's a complete genius. And so why that is relevant is if you were to go out and let's say buy a $400,000 property today and... You know, you just go and buy it anywhere so you get 4% capital growth per year for the next 15 years versus following some of these, you know, what I call rules of investing for growth um, today that we talk about and getting a 6% return on that same money. So the same money going into the market but being thoughtful of where you mm. place it and looking for value instead of just anything. The difference between that 2% per year of 6 to 4% represents about $230,000 over the next 15 years. But what if you had a million bucks to invest that million at 4% a year versus six, the difference is 550K better off. So when I started to play with these growth calculators, that's when I got super serious about this, not because I want the extra money. It was more, I feel like I have a duty of care mm. with a young family to invest the money in the best, safest, and most profitable place so that instead of working for the next 30 years, I can work for the next 15. Yeah, I absolutely love it. You know, we're all investing to get a return on our investment. And this is an investment that's costing us hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, <laughs> a, a, a one-hour <laughs> one podcast is probably worthwhile, you know, when we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars here. If everyone just from listening to this podcast with their future returns over the next 30 years, which are going to be exponentially better, just want to pay Simon and I a 1% dividend, <laughs> we'll be super grateful. You can pay it when you sell them down the line. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Um, but let's get into it. We've got about 11 different things written down here on the page that we want to talk about. Um, kind of going in, in order of importance in a way. Um, but the first one being uh, major metro markets. You know, Simon was just, Simon sent me some data. Was it from CoreLogic? Yeah. Um, literally this week that looked at the 20 year performance of all the big capital cities in Oz, which was exceptionally higher than I thought it yeah. would be. Like, mm. you know, I think you said Brisbane's done 8.6% per annum in the last 20 years. Yeah. Sydney and Melbourne were a quite a bit above that too with yeah. Melbourne being number one I think. Yeah. Melbourne was a top performer, um, Sydney and Brisbane were actually relatively close yeah. um, but still quite a, quite a difference between the two of them and um, a little dark horse in there was Hobart. Oh Hobart's kicked some ass <laughs> in the last 10 years. Yeah yeah over the last 10 years but what we loved about looking at Brisbane the 20 year performance had been around 176 or 178 uh, which averages out at about 8.5 uh, but the interesting thing was the 10-year performance was only 11%. So, 1% per year. <laughs> 1% per year. <laughs> so, you know, Brisbane only really cranked for about eight of the last 20 years and it, and it still managed to, to be one of the top performers around Australia, which is nice. You know, it's an interesting thing that because you've got two types of people that own property in Brisbane. You've got people that have held for 20 years that love it. You've got people that bought there in the last 10 years that hate it. Hate it. it. It's the same as Sydney. You've got people that have owned for 20 years. Like the last 10 have been exceptional. The 10 before that were 1.5% per annum. Same with Hobart. The last six or seven have been exceptional. And the 10 years before that, I remember talking to my uncle, were absolutely zeros. Yeah, so that's why we're long-term investors. You know, we create at least sort of 20-year plans for ourselves, at mm -hmm. least sort of 15-year plans for most of our clients because... The old theory of property doubling every 10 years is just gone. Gone. It's gone, skis. I mean, even though it's done that in Sydney, Hobart, and Melbourne in the last... <laughs> <year>. <laughs> 
And even though I was probably gonna, no, nah, I'm not gonna predict any futures. So the reason this is important um, from our perspective and why we only buy Metro for ourselves or major, major regional markets is when CoreLogic looked at the data over the last 20 years, um, the Metro markets being Sydney, Perth, Darwin, Melbourne, etc., had outperformed the regional markets by 86%, which is insane. And that immediately changed the way that I invest in property. Now, the previous podcast, which is definitely worth a listen, is all around timing. You cannot get long-term capital growth without understanding that. So I think after this one, it'd be great to go back and check that out too, because they're so connected, it's not funny. Definitely. And one of the things with the metro markets and, and one of the major drivers of gains in the property market is population growth. Yeah. And the major metro markets around Australia have historically had the lion's share of this. So it's it's not rocket science and it's <laughs> it's not, you know, taboo to think that metro markets outperform regional markets when you logically think about the fundamental drivers of, of capital growth. And you know, one of the other interesting things, which is why we really love metro markets, is understanding where the percentages have actually been throughout Australia in the past. Now, we saw some information from the ABS where basically they were saying that Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane had had 75% of Australia's population and job growth historically, with 25% going to Melbourne. 25% to Sydney and 25% to Southeast Queensland, with the remaining 25% being dispersed throughout the rest of Australia. I think so, in, and Perth taking 8%. So really, if you add 75 and 8, there's a small number of people going everywhere else. Exactly. Um, so looking at that, and then that, they're also saying that this is going to continue in the future. I believe I saw an article from Michael Matusik that thinks that it could even be higher than 75% between those three markets. You know, I'm not a gambler, but when I'm <laughs> playing, um, when I am playing the tables with the boys at the CAS, um, I would be playing red and black because of the odds. I just can't help myself. It's the game with the highest odds for me as a non-professional investor that takes it way too seriously when I'm doing it. <laughs> Can I just <laughs> interject a, a something that's got nothing to do with this podcast, but for <laughs> our Christmas party this year, we've hired an epic party bus with like the karaoke machine <laughs> and stripper pole and like it's like a nightclub <laughs> on wheels. It's going to be so fun. But the guy's got a thing in Brisbane Afterwards, we should just stay with him all the way down to Brizzy, drop us off at the cast. Drop us off at the cast. So, like, when Simon and I, like, we went to America a few years back with a bunch of our friends. Um, I think there were eight of us. And we got to Vegas on the first night after a pretty heavy five days before that in LA. That's <laughs> one way to put it. Yeah, um, a pretty good time. And we've, we've got into Vegas and we've got to the hotel and one of the boys who's a bit cheeky, he's a male nurse. Um, I don't know why that's relevant, but we've always got to give him shit about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, he's like talking to them and we knew that the hotel was empty. Um, and so he's like asked for an upgrade to the penthouse, which we've got for literally like 80 bucks for mm. two nights. And we've walked into this room, we've had a few beers and then all of the boys got ready together got completely suited up, walked straight down to the tables. Um, we'd been, me and another mate, Maka, who was one of the best men at my wedding, had been going back and forth with his banter for like a year before this trip on, when we get to Vegas, we're gonna drop some big money on red or black. And so we've walked down all suited up, all liquored up and ready to roll to this $5 table that had just opened. We'd put the money down, it had spun, and just before um, it had, like she'd said, last call, I pulled the money off because I had this bad feeling and it went red. And then we've jumped to the next table, watched a few games and then put it down. I think we had like a thousand US um, mm. on it and we've just won a thousand US like that quickly. Straight away. Take it, all of the boys are going absolutely that off. Was such a good time. <laughs> Got some beers, went straight back up to the room, and then we just dropped it on the tables and like when we got bottle service and stuff. It was just the funnest, such a good little trip, little eh? vibe. Like it was just incredible. That so, was literally the last time I went to a casino as well. I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, no, I went to Brisbane with Lola, <laughs> <laughs> um, and just sat on the roulette table for five hours with him. We got up a thousand bucks as well, and then ended up losing it. <laughs> oh no! But um. <laughs> Anyway, like, sorry to digress. Because I'm not a gambler, like, they're the two times I've gambled yeah. in the last five years. Um, you know, I, d I play the same game in property, which is I go for what is 
you know, giving me the best odds. And if 75% of Australia's population, job and income growth are coming in Sydney, Melbourne, Southeast Queensland, that's where I want to be. 100%, 100%, because more people means more eyes, more demand, you know, it's going to, it's going to put pressure on those markets. Um, so obviously metro markets, population growth, super important. Um, for us, we typically focus on Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane with Brisbane being in um, arguably the best stage of the property cycle right now. Um, so that's why we, we're constantly talking about the Brisbane market. So the second thing that we follow in terms of like getting above average capital gains is only buying houses. I think Fred Harrison said it best in the 80s in his book, The Power in the Land. That's where the value is. Mm -hmm. And those who control the land and what's beneath the structure are the ones that end up winning over time. Mm. Um, Phil Anderson also talks about it. He talks about everyone should become a land owner mm. because governments and banks always support the artificial inflation of that asset and have done for hundreds of years around the world. For sure. And we know we, we've talked about it. I can't remember how many times I've said this on camera or in a strategy session. Twice. <laughs> it's coming 200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least. Hey. Um, but CoreLogic did a study. They looked at the performance in houses compared it to the performance of units in Australia over 25 years and the houses that outperformed the units by 96%. So once again, the numbers just don't lie. Imagine missing, you know, buying a unit in a regional market 20 years ago, you'd almost be 150% worse off in some markets than had you put the same money in the metro. Very, very, very simple KPI to follow. So the next one is, um, there's a guy who is a great analyst in Brisbane. He's been in the markets for a long time called Michael Matusik. Um, he did a really cool study around Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Darwin, Canberra, Adelaide, etc. And he looked at houses within 5Ks of the CBD, houses within 20 and houses further than 20. And what my interpretation of his data was that were houses within that closer proximity being 20Ks have performed better than houses further away. It makes sense. That's where the services are. That's where the infrastructure is. That's where the better schools are, the higher paying jobs are, arguably the better lifestyles. If you're not looking for suburbia, which I love, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's where the value has always been. And that's where the concentration of wealth always sits. An alternative to that is being closer to the beaches or being closer to the water because us Australians love to live by the water. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a no brainer. So coupling those two things, you know, closer to the city, um, but then also closer to those, um, you know, water, ocean, rivers, whatever it may be as well. So when you think about Brisbane, for example, you know, we much prefer getting as close to the city that we can afford or buy within a couple of Ks of the beaches. Uh, we don't really like to go out to the northwest or the southwest because you're getting further away from the water and you're getting further away from the city. Same goes for Sydney. It's basically the exact same, closer to the city or on the eastern, northern or southern beaches. Um, and then Melbourne's the, the same. Like The concentration of wealth is East Melbourne mm. and that's because of the water in the port, St Kilda, and then the Mornington Peninsula, Geelong. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at Newcastle, Central Coast, you look at Perth. You even look at the more expensive places in Darwin. I was up there a few weeks ago for a, um, for something. And, um, you know, the, the concentration of wealth always sits around the water. Exactly. Um, so once again, not rocket science, luckily. I was watching something or listening to something the other day and it just made my heart sink. It was some guy that... Um, you know, some people were kicking off in Monaco because um, a big a big landowner had just come in and purchased a huge <laughs> building in front of all of these waterfront mansions that were worth $35 million each. And he was going to build these units straight in front of them and completely block their water views. And I was just thinking about that as like just an insane thing, you know what I mean? Like the value of land and what Phil was talking about is they're not just building on the water anymore. They're building physically in the water. In like the in a water. lot of places around the world, they're starting to reclaim extra water back and pump sand in and just 
create more landmass on the water to artificially spike prices even further. He was talking about how like sought after sand is actually going to become as well, like as a good commodity. He sounds like he's moving into sand trade. <laughs> <laughs> he's off He's off the uh, property bandwagon, he's getting sand. Getting into sand, but it made sense, right? Like I yeah. had no idea that um, like sand is like almost one of the, like there's more sand than fossil fuels mm. used around the world for mm. construction because mm. I suppose every concrete mm. needs a sand mix, mm. right? Exactly. So within ideally 20 Ks, but you know, if you can't afford within 20 Ks, it's, it's not the end of the world. If you're looking within sort of 25, 30 kilometers of these major metro markets like Melbourne, Sydney or Brisbane. Uh, the next is the pocket of the market as well. Um, so ideally getting into the high quality pockets, which I've just sort of briefly talked about, but let's unpack that in more detail. You know, if you're living in Sydney, like Simon said, the high quality pockets are close to the city, northern beaches, eastern beaches, southern beaches. In Melbourne, eastern side is the high quality pocket. In Brisbane, eastern side, northeast, southeast is the high quality pockets. And it's the same on Perth, I think. Obviously, over there, it's the western side, yeah. but close to the city, close to the beach. Same yeah. in Adelaide, Hills District, or on the water. Yeah. Now, why this is important is you've got an opportunity as an investor to not just go for Metro, not just go for Sydney, not just go for um, a good-sized piece of land close to the city, but then you've got the position as an investor to be the kid in the candy store and choose the best place in the city to invest. Now, North Sydney and Southern Sydney have had significantly better gains over the last 10 years in the same cycle that Western Sydney has had. And Warren Buffett says the rising tide lifts all boats. But when the tide does go back out, which it always does, certain markets perform much better. And that's why we've seen Southern Sydney and Northern Sydney a lot more stable in the last year with the coronavirus than you know Western Sydney, where in some suburbs prices have dropped as much as 15%. Yeah, and on top of that, um, this idea of a ripple effect, which is essentially you know, when a market starts to take off, the closer to the city, the higher quality areas go first, and then it ripples out to the rest of the market. Um, so when you're looking at, at a pocket of a market, it can be in your interest to look at these areas that have already received amazing capital gains because they're the blue chip highest quality areas in the city. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can be in a neighboring suburb within one to two kilometers of some of these suburbs that have ridiculous, amazing value where there's huge differences in the median house price. But in terms of the demographics and what those areas offer, relatively similar it just hasn't had that ripple effect yet and this is one of the things that we really like to do for for ourselves and and our clients and it's also about identifying areas that have got a little bit of gentrification potential as well um, so rather than buying in the areas that have already taken off that are already well well established looking at the trends that are occurring in in other areas that may be just slightly a bit further away but have the same sort of fundamentals that, you know, that could be the next area because you want to buy as close to the bottom as you possibly can. Completely. And there's just so many examples of that everywhere. Like there's a suburb in Brisbane called Sunnybank that attracts a lot of the um, international agent money and, you know, properties there will sell for a million bucks. And then literally on the other side of the road is a suburb called Acacia Ridge where you could buy a house today for under 400 k mm. Um, that ripple effect hasn't gone across the road, but I have to think it's only a matter of time mm. before, you know, that money moves across, everything in the suburb gets demolished and rebuilt out. But sometimes it can take 15 years for mm. that to happen. Like mm. we saw that in Redfern in Sydney. We yeah. saw that in Surrey Hills and Piermont in Sydney. It was just, it took time for those like traditionally ghetto areas mm. to improve. Same with Maroubra, same with Cronulla Beach. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the next one is the pocket of the suburb now. The story that we've got here is our parents, right? So um, when they bought our second family home, which was in Engadine in the south side of Sydney, they bought a cul-de-sac, super, super quiet street, surrounded by beautiful homes with slightly bigger land, right backing onto the bush, and they bought a more expensive, larger home. Like I think when we moved in, it was seven bedrooms, mm. and then they turned it into like a five-bedder. But I remember running through the house, coming from like our little tiny little house that we grew up in, little which little was cottage. just epic. Um, little two-bed cottage with six, six, <laughs> six people living in there. <laughs> yeah. It was like, oh, my God, this is the biggest thing I've ever seen. I remember, like, running down the stairs and hanging on them and, like, 
seeing the bedrooms and all of these bathrooms and I'm like, what the hell is going on? It was a huge house. Like, why had this like, it was sick massive. bar. Oh, it was the best place to grow up. We had a pool table. We had a big back deck. Pool. pool looking over the bush we had a spa jump off the roof with a bodyboard in my hand trying to do tricks into the pool from like three stories high i remember and i'm just like what the hell am i doing looking back at that now it's so funny <laughs> i remember like ben used to just be such a little rat bag when he was like in his late teens but we would have christmas at our house most years and um, I just remember everybody sitting outside on the deck, like having drinks and stuff <laughs> like that. Ben wasn't around. Mum's got her back to the pool. And then all of a sudden you see Ben just like fall off, not fall, jump off the <laughs> roof and just bomb and wet everyone and all the food. And mum just like chasing him around going, Ben, you can't do it. <laughs> my mum's favourite thing to do is you chasing around with a wooden spoon and then she'd break it on my ass and we'd just laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a little tormentor. Um, but yeah, like I think what I learned from them, which we've actually like qualified through looking at suburbs in a lot more detail with the business is them spending that little bit of extra money now i can't remember how much they paid for the home like high threes or maybe early 400s yeah that um, would have been in 96 97 yeah um now their property would now be worth 1.4 mil mm -hmm. but properties that were for sale for 300k in 96 on main roads and now only worth 800k mm. and so what i noticed is that if you buy the better we'll talk about this in more but you buy the better quality pocket surrounded by more affluent people with higher average sales values. As the market improves in value, higher quality pockets become better pockets over time. So how do you identify these quality pockets of the suburb is, is very simple. Um, you print out a map of the suburb that you're looking in. Just on Google Maps or whatever, Apple Maps. Simple as that. You then look on uh, real estate investor or something like that and you get the median house price or for that particular sub. Yeah, yeah realestate.com, simple as that. The median house price. And then you look at realestate.com, the sold se section for the last six months and you dot point every single sale that's occurred in that so what we like to do is three different colors one that's below the median house price one that's at the median house price and one that's above the median house price and once you've done this and you've got you know 30 40 50 dots on the map in just one suburb you'll start to get a better understanding of where the lower quality pockets are and where the higher quality pockets are and this is the simplest way to do it and that you know, is almost good enough to do once, it, we do it once every three months for the mm. last five years, but what I've noticed is that the quality pockets don't change. Don't change, no. And you can, you know, really use that to your advantage. And what a lot of first time investors or amateur investors do versus professional investors is they think that making 20K on the way in by like haggling with the agent or- Got to buy under market value. Yeah, is like the trick. And I'm like, sweet man like you just bought a main road that mm. one decision is going to cost you 500k over the next 30 years mm -hmm. and you tried to save 20 on the way in and so investors like simon and i that are professional understand that all of these little things matter mm. and i don't miss them like if i look at every single property i have right now in my portfolio it ticks every single one of these absolutely these goals except one of them that's on a main road but that was for like short-term rental and that was acceptable. Yeah, yeah, of course. There was more connectivity which mattered there. But, you know, that that's another level for, for the fundamentals for people that are, um, you know, just building their portfolio. You must target all them. Like that was your 12th property or something. Yeah, without a it doubt. Was it was a strategic purchase. So you look at that, but then pocket of suburb as well. You also want to be on the nice, quiet, family-friendly streets away from the busy areas in the suburb, you know, in those tree line streets where all the houses are maintained really well the lawns look really good that kids can go out and play on the street these are the things that you want to look for for sure um now land size is important i was talking to chris one of our clients the other day and i said you know my wife says size doesn't matter but he said <laughs> it fucking does mate <laughs> i hope you're doing well chris eh? um but yeah like land size is definitely important and i think um, you know, for us as a business, 500 square meters is a nice to have. You know, sometimes we'll go in the 400s if it represents exceptional value. But, you know, 600, 800, 1,000 square meters is like super common in Brisbane still. And I think what I've learned from Sydney and Melbourne is that the most likely 
blocks to be rezoned for higher density would be 600 square meters plus mm. so with that model in mind you know hoping that something changes and it creates a higher land value for us in the future we buy those bigger blocks when we can well what's what we've we've seen it happen in melbourne they had to rezone and, and allow people to subdivide smaller blocks because the population increased and they didn't have the supply and um, you know we can see brisbane going in that direction the abs believes that there's going to be over 5 million people living in Brisbane within the next sort of 26, 27 years. So yeah. the population is going to get to those same levels. Who knows whether that's going to happen. But if you do have a block of land that's slightly larger, it's going to give you the potential in the future and you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. People that say that the Australian dream has changed from large land lots are fucking developers. Yeah, Nobody yeah. <laughs> else. Like, you know what I mean? Like the only people saying that Australians want smaller lot sizes are developers that are trying to sell that dream. But I strongly believe as someone with three young kids that land size is everything to me. I want that Australian experience. I mm. want that big block. I want to like grow my own shit. I want to mm. have a water tank. I want solar panels. Like I, I don't believe the Australian dream is dead. And I think people that buy 300 square meter blocks now in new estates will be absolutely kicking themselves that they didn't pay the extra 20K for the 500 square meter block in the future. Yeah, they'll probably be out of it within five years. Yeah, well, most of that stepping stone stuff. Yeah. Like, lots of investors buy it, they step out of it, and then mums and dads move into it over time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so land size does matter in this case, guys. So go out and get the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So. Um, following on from that, um, key, I, I can't read your handwriting, bro. <laughs> this says key indicators. Now, what we're talking about there is the key indicators that we look for at the very start of the experience when we're looking to choose which suburb to buy in. Ah, uh, cool. So, you know, for example, recently we went through a full review of the Brisbane market. While there's honestly 50 or 60 indicators we look at, 20 of them, are on a sheet which are important there's really only three or four that we mm. are absolute deal breakers for us and ones that if they don't sit on a certain threshold i completely get rid of straight away and simple to find these sorts of this sort of information as well but the first one's income is that what it says because i don't i can't I'm, even read it it is but it's one of the it's, <laughs> it's definitely one of the ones so income you want to be in an area where you've got a higher than average household income because you need these people to be able to afford the rent or afford to buy a property in the area simple as that you know there's some suburbs in sydney and melbourne where the house prices are 11 to 15 times the average household income i feel sorry for those people and when people say that australian property is unaffordable and there's a bubble then that's what they're referring to although i strongly believe that sydney and melbourne are now global markets and they're, ch they're cheap from a global perspective yeah. like they're dirt cheap compared to monaco hong kong la new york the big cities okay. of the states and Europe, but they're really expensive if you're an Australian. So if, if Australia is just going to be an Australian market moving forward, those cities are overvalued. If they let hundreds of thousands of international investors in in the next five years, which I believe they will, then they're arguably cheap. Mm. So, you know, that's important to understand. In Brisbane, in most of the areas we're buying, the average house price is only three to five times more than the average household income, which is the sort of thing that our grandparents were used to when mm. they were investing, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Is there, that'd be nice to see like what the average has been. Call Logic, if any of you guys are watching this, can you I've please seen, see that? I've seen it before. You mean the average annual like income versus values over time? Yeah. Yeah, so like historically that sat at about just below 4% Australia wide. Okay. Um, and a, and a nice range because interest rates are also a lot cheaper now than they were. So actually when they look at it, I looked at this from Core Logic recently, house prices are actually cheaper to own now than they have been at almost any other point in Australian history Wow! because the debt position based on the interest rates being so low, mm. even though the, the values might be higher, is just incredible. Mm. Like it's never From an affordability this, perspective. From a day-to-day -day affordability perspective, it's never been easier or cheaper to own. But that doesn't mean you should go buy a property that's 10 times your income. That's crazy. Mm. That's the sort of stuff that scares you, that makes you rock at night. Makes you work until 70 years of age. You know, like good quality affordable property though, that's three to five times the average household income 
is like the sweet spot because not only can you afford it as an investor, but the mums and dads living mm. in the suburb can afford to pay more rent and pay more on the values as they rise over time, which we're always looking for. For sure. Now, the next one is vacancy rates at the suburb level as well. This for investors has got to be one of the most important things that you look at. Um, the last thing that you want when you buy a property is for it to sit with no tenants in there. You want consistent income coming through. So um, there's a sweet spot for us um, where we're, when we're looking at suburbs and we're looking at places that we want to invest in, if there's a vacancy rate over 2%, it's not even going to be considered. Um, whereas if it's below 2%, this is sort of where we really want it to sit because 2% sort of indicates that there's there may be a little bit of an undersupply of rental properties. Now, the lower that that comes, the better. It means just more and more pressure. A lot of the places that we're investing in right now have a vacancy rate of below 1%, which is chronically undersupplied. It's insane. Like I've never seen vacancy rates drop in Southeast Queensland as quickly as they have in the last six weeks. They've gone from, you know, 2% in some suburbs to a quarter or half of 1%. Mm. It's extremely low. I've heard in places on the sunny coast, you've got 50 applications on an, a single property. Like there's people living in hotels because they can't physically get a place to live right now as they move up. When I just bought my home that I wanted to live in, I settled in the beginning of August and I had tenants in the property and um, I just took over the management because I wasn't going to pay a management agency to try and get them out but they were aware of moving out and they'd been applying for rental properties from June. Wow. And it took them until the middle of August, two and a half months to find a rental property to move into. Um, it ended up being a case where I the purchaser of the house was looking on the rental market, physically calling the <laughs> rental managers and saying, do you have any properties in this price range with these indicators and saying that I've got a tenant and I was literally selling the tenant to them and it, and it ended up happening. I called a place that they'd already <laughs> applied to. Um, so I called them and I'm like, oh, this is perfect. And she actually asked me, she's like, what are they like? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, they're great. They've consistently paid their rent in the past, um, you know, she has a, a disabled child, unfortunately, so they're not gonna wanna move around. They wanna stay in there for a long period of time. And Jesus, uh, bro, you're brutal kicking a disabled child oh, out I'm of Bro, don't make me feel like, any worse <laughs> than I already do. <laughs> Um, so yeah. you were knocking down the place, right? That's why you had to move them? No, nah, this is the place that I, I wanted to move oh, into, yeah, the one up here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, nah, I'm happy to kick the ones out down in, in, um, North in Brisbane because they stopped paying <laughs> uh, at one point in time, but that's all good. That's another story in itself. Yeah, that's like early coronavirus stuff. Like I think the market's moved past leaving the oh, keys yeah. in the kitchen sink like they did on my property. <laughs> It happens, you know, it happens. What's, uh, what's important though, like in Melbourne, inner city Melbourne right now, units have a, a vacancy rate over 10%. That almost means that you're going to have to drop your rent by 100 bucks and you're going to have to look at 12 weeks a year of vacancy. So these things are important and, you know, it's more of a cash flow thing than a capital growth thing, but we find that quality suburbs with higher percentages of owner occupiers, which is our next one, have naturally lower vacancy rates anyway. The reason why vacancy rates in inner city Melbourne and Sydney have gone nuts is because 80% of that product is mm. owned by investors and it's like, do you really want something mm. that's 80% investor or would you prefer something that's 80% owner-occupied? I know exactly where I sit. Yeah, me too. Of course, you want the areas with the owner-occupiers because from a capital growth perspective, these are the people that are going to pay an emotional price for a property to be in the area. They also have surplus income and they reinvested in renovations and mm. knockdown rebuilds. And over 15 years, that has a big impact on the quality of one suburb versus another. Yeah, so the sweet spot that we're looking at when it comes to percentage of owner occupiers to renters is about 70% owner occupiers to 30% renters. That's, that's really the sweet spot um, that we're ideally looking at. You'll find with a lot of super blue chip inner city property and super blue chip beachside locations that the percentages will be different than that, normally 40% or 50% renters. That's just because, you know, naturally wealthier people speculate around certain areas close to the city and the beach, and that's just more natural. But in an ideal world, if we had our way on every property, that would be the mix like 70, 30, or even 80, 20. And these can fluctuate as well, so you need to consistently look at it as well um, because you never know who's going to be buying into the area. 
Um, like as Ben said, we, we look at all of these indicators at least once a quarter. Yeah. Um, so the other things that can support capital growth in a particular suburb is, you know, let's say you've got two suburbs, you've done all of the research, you've found the best pocket of the city, the best pocket of these suburbs, and you're choosing which one to go for. Um, infrastructure plays a huge part. So quality of schools, quality and access to main roads. Um, does it have a train station? Does it have a major shopping center close by? Does it have, you know, smaller shopping centers in the suburb? All of these things, although they might not be everything, are very, very, very important to other people, particularly mums and dads choosing a suburb long term or investors choosing the suburb as well. So I'll always go for the better school district, the place with the train station over something that doesn't. Can you explain the example of this in northeast Brisbane? Because you've been buying on that peninsula there for a while back in sort of 2015-16 and then the train station opened up. Yeah, so here's a perfect example of it. These were beachside suburbs in Brisbane that a um, hundred odd years ago they proposed its first train line and 105 <laughs> years later we got it. <laughs> what that did is open up that area to a whole new demographic of people that don't want to drive to the city for work. It also connected the beach to the uni or the new uni to the city. Um, that drove prices up literally that quickly by 20%. Um, unfortunately, I didn't own any property when it did. <laughs> I got in just after, but that's okay. Now, Catherine Cashmore, who's another analyst in Melbourne, has done a huge report on infrastructure. And in the past, like Michael Matusik's data that we talked about, generally closest to the city had won in terms of capital gains, but she'd done a full review of every suburb within 50 k's of Melbourne. And she'd found that what people want now that they're more lifestyle driven is closeness to the city so this suburb could be 27 k's but if it had a great arterial road mm. straight to the city and a great train line then that might actually be hundreds of k more expensive than this place 15 k's from the city that doesn't have it i was watching million dollar listing new york the other day and the difference between properties that sell in new york with the train station walking distance versus ones that don't is literally millions of dollars wow. for the same thing a block apart Infrastructure is so important, so important. You can get a lot of this information but on, on the local council websites, but you just don't know when it's going to come. Like the Sunshine Coast has been talking about putting a light rail in for God knows how long, um, a heavy rail also coming into in like closer to the beaches because it's currently about 20, 30 k's west of the beaches up here on the Sunshine Coast. But, you know, when that happens, it's going to be a complete game changer again. Um, so you can go find this information, but like Ben said, a hundred years down in Brisbane for one of these, and then this plan has been in, on the sunny coast for probably 50 years as well. You know, what I noticed is from Phil Anderson's work is that you make your money, if you're an infrastructure investor, you have to be in before the infrastructure is built. Mm. You have to be in on the planning phase. The beautiful thing about Australia is Every single project planned for the next five years is already online and you can look on the government's websites or the local plan town planning websites and actually figure this out for yourselves. But I don't chase infrastructure because it's just a short-term spike. Mm. I chase quality, make sure there's good infrastructure in place and if more infrastructure is coming, that's just an upside. But yeah. I don't want to be one of those hot spotters that just rush around chasing infrastructure at the, ex you know, make that 100K quickly at the expense of the 500K that they would have made on a better property. Yeah, which is why we talked about the other ones before this one as well. We tried to give it the best hierarchy that we possibly could. So infrastructure is great. Uh, as Ben said, rail, major arterial roads, schools, shopping centers, hospitals, universities, um, employment options and things like this are all extremely important. Even, you know, amenities like a nice esplanade to go for a walk on or a, or a bushland um, you know these things as well are important definitely um, so the next is at the street level um, because this can can be really important to avoid buying on the wrong street or ideally buying on the right street which can completely change the long-term performance of that particular property for a number of different reasons um, so for us we will we like to be buying on those nice quiet family friendly streets that um, you know, the kids can play out on the street. Normally, the houses have been well looked after. As Ben was saying, with the owner-occupiers, 
um, being on these streets, uh, they're going to add more value to their properties and make it look a lot nicer as well. And um, as we're doing our checklist at every single property, uh, we're looking at the percentage of owner occupiers to renters that we believe to be in that area because you may buy in a suburb that's got an owner occupier to rent a percentage of, let's say, 70 to 30 or 60 to 40, but the street that you're buying on could be 90% owner occupied to 10% investors. Um, but it could also be the opposite. You may be buying in a suburb that's got 70% owner occupiers to 30% renters, but you might buy on a street that's got 70% investors with 30% owner occupiers. So the quality of the street is really important. You know, often interstate investors buying in like Perth or Adelaide or Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, will look online and they won't understand these things and they won't understand the market to the level that they need to to make the best decision. And so what will happen is like, for example, on the beaches in Brizzy the other day, there was this extremely affordable piece of land. It was a knockdown home for like 330K. And immediately I went, fuck, that's cheap. Like mm. I looked at it personally. I looked on um, RP data and I found that um, six out of the 10 houses in the cul-de-sac were housing commission. And then I did a drive-by because I I thought oh, it's cheap enough to even potentially... For, this was Knowing that personal, that'll change as yeah, well. Yeah, because I know that the council's already selling out all that housing commission. It's just a matter of time before they break up that concentration. And then I drove into the street and I went, oh, this is a shithole. Mm. Like, straight away. And then the, sub, the street that I drove into was surrounded by 600k homes, drove into this one. You've got your traditional post-war housing commission, three bedders on stumps. And I went... It looks like I'm, you know, 50 years in the past yeah. right now and I just drove straight out of the street. So, you know, it's these things are important. You know, how, how many people are, you know, mowing their lawns? How many people mm. have beautiful gardens? Like how many people's cars are washed? How many people have shit out the front of their property? Um, you know, you can sort of get a gauge for that on satellite, but that's why people partner with people like us because it's like we're on the ground, we're physically inspecting it and while you can do all of this stuff to make sure you get the right capital growth, there's still an intuitive feel that mm. you need to have as an investor, plus 150-point checklist that we do. <laughs> that also helps. <laughs> that protects me from my intuitions. <laughs> um, to, you know, qualify that something does make sense at the granular street level and then the house level. Yeah. You know, like I said, with my example of my second family home, it was a huge home. Mum and dad were worried because they paid an extra 75k for it than they might have on a cheaper street. But that one decision made them an extra 500k when they sold it and would have made them an extra 800k by now. They held it. Yeah, exactly. Um, bigger houses always are great as well. You know, when we're looking at the internals of a property, we, we really want it to be over at least 100 square meters because it's going to give enough for a solid three by three bedrooms, um, all with built-in robes, a decent sized living area, a decent sized kitchen, um, because it makes it a lot more livable. If you're in these tiny little shacks, then it's not very livable for a family. You know, you want um, good sized bedrooms, um, good living spaces like living kitchens, dinings, opening onto backyards and our frescoes. Um, you know, there's just a lot of little things there which we don't have to go into, but just think about if you were earning 200 grand a year regardless if you're earning more than that or less and you had three children right now where would you want to live mm. and then buy for that family because the australian population trends are actually changing we're at 2.8 children per household again where 10 years ago we we're at 2.1 mm. they thought it was going to be two children but it looks like three seems to be almost like a new norm that we're okay. trending towards um, you know, what do people moving to Australia from overseas, like if there's going to be 400,000 people move to Australia on average a year, what do they want with mm. their families? Like, what are they going to want to rent off you? Um, you know, as people, more generations live under one roof line, like mums and dads plus grandma and grandpa or mature kids, what do they need from you? And if you look at the cool place that Simon's just building or I'm building, we're really catering for that future, like... Mm living spaces downstairs that are nice and open so families can actually have meaningful time like good bedrooms little study nooks so kids or families can work from home separate small living spaces upstairs just to chuck an extra tv so that the teenagers or grandma and grandpa can, can have their own room um you know but obviously with 99 percent of properties in australia being existing 
there's always a compromise, but thinking about this stuff can really help make you more gains. And again, bigger in most suburbs, like most suburbs with 400K to a mil, bigger homes are generally better for long-term growth. As an investor, you've obviously got to logically analyze the data, the history, the information that you have to make the right call. But then at the same time, we're playing on and we're using the emotion of these owner occupiers to identify properties as well. So it's kind of a dual prong strategy or looking at two different tiers. And obviously as an investor, we're using our logical mind, but the funny thing is you need to play on these emotions as well to get that future performance. And you've said it before, like some of the best capital gains that you've had have been from those emotional purchases of your own home. Every one of them has been from an emotional purchaser. Um, I just think about something, right, that I, I made a big mistake last year, but it was also the best property I've ever bought. But it was a big mistake from one perspective. So I was going into this property. It was a big, beautiful piece of land. I built like a nice three-bedroom home with a two-bed granny flat custom designed home to be the perfect family home for airbnb and now i wasn't thinking with my normal hat on because i'd bought the property the day after auction after seeing it a day before i really didn't put my buyer's agency ben what would i do for a client perspective on and i sort of was so focused on this airbnb that i forgot about what the normal market wants yeah because the cash flow sort of took you away i was only focused on cash flow now i bought built this small three bedroom home with a beautiful big deck with a small two bedroom granny flat and my valuation came in at a million bucks which was about a hundred grand less than i'd spent like it was expensive to do this thing brand new and it was a fucking huge home it's like 400 square meters but lots of deck and stuff epic how if i had of literally thought about it the way that i do now and i'll never ever make this mistake again i would have built a four bedroom home with three bathrooms it would have cost me an extra 30 grand to do that and my valuation would have been 1.3 mil Mm. same suburb 50k that's how much these things mm. can make an impact now the cash flow is amazing i'm stoked with it it is the perfect airbnb property but it's going to affect my future resale and it's a good lesson to learn from me that you don't have to make yourself mm. yeah i'm so glad that you've made all these mistakes bro because now <laughs> <I don't have laughs> to. no problems man just give me like two million bucks is what i've lost how like, funny is it though? like we said that so many times <laughs> eh? like you just look at my first property and you're like fuck i wish that was my first property <laughs> my second one you first God, damn it. down it's like the perfect design <laughs> yeah legit yeah that one is such a nice crisp design i can't wait for that to start hopefully my evaluations work out but I guess it'll depend on yours. It will, and it already will, and it already has because it's the right stuff. Of course. Ticking all these boxes, I think our job and our passion is to inspire you to make better decisions, to be more thoughtful with those decisions, and to realize that if you're not feeling comfortable with this, then people like us exist purely to support you to think about the things that you might not think about. So if any of those you guys haven't, you know, are thinking of buying in the next three to six months or 12 months, please jump over to the website pumpedonproperty.com and book a free strategy session in with Simon or myself. We can talk about where you are, where you want to go, educate you on things like this. Like this is one thing, one thing. Like we also look at timing, capital growth, capital growth cash flow tax benefits manufacturing value like there's just so much madness to this method mm. that we get so excited to inspire people to like learn how to fish themselves so that for the rest of their lives mm. they've got property down pat i love and that, that bro feels so confident yeah exactly you know what is it Cat catch a fish for somebody they'll have a meal they'll have one meal teach somebody how to fish they'll have meals for a lifetime it's like that's that's what we want somebody said it i think it was jib is jesus <laughs> oh, yeah probably <laughs> it's in the bible i don't know man i haven't read it from cover to cover just yet this, just this guy didn't really have much of an impact <laughs> not, not very influential dude but i guess we shouldn't uh, we went to a catholic school um, um, that's like, <laughs> digging ourselves out of a hole um I completely forget what I was going to say there. Um, yeah, sorry but yeah, that's that. essentially what we really want for everybody listening to this podcast is to figure out the tools and tricks to be able to do it alone. But, you know, we are here to support anybody um, that, you know, needs that extra little bit of help because it is pretty overwhelming and it is pretty hard to figure all of this stuff out. And it's only because yeah. we've bought hundreds of millions of dollars of property that we've been able to 
tinker with our process and, and put all of these different things into place so that we are focusing on the right ones. And, you know, you just can't fake experience in those sorts of situations. No, I've learned just as much from the business, if not more than I have as a personal investor. And I think I've, from talking to 3000 people, you hear what's working, what's not. Mm. And all of the things that we talk about, which we've learned from the data from CoreLogix, Matusik, Phil Anderson's, Fred Harrison's is like, shown every single day that we talk mm. to someone it's really cool i just i think the hardest thing to find in this world is people that really deeply care mm. like our whole value system is built around that individually and in the business but people that also know their shit yeah that have the runs on the board to deliver yeah. consistently above average results that are doing it skin in the game as well you know we don't just tell people to do this this is what so, we do ourselves um, which is great. So I guess thanks so much for, for tuning in again and, and following us on this podcast. If you can please share it with somebody that, that doesn't necessarily understand the idea of capital growth or, or how you can focus on assets that are going to provide you with long-term capital growth, you know, get it out there and um, always give us a five-star review as well. You this know, was the a more... five-star podcast, man, like I've got to say. Yeah, I think all of them are going to be moving forward, eh? <laughs> Um, so we can't give it a five star review because it's not really going to do too much but you can and that's going to enable more people to see this and, and it's going to get more ears um, and more awareness so people stop making stupid mistakes yeah myself included um keep me accountable bro i think the other week actually just as a side note i bought this property because i wanted to buy something <laughs> simon said to me like i just don't think it really perfectly fits with your strategy on day one I like went through all the due diligence process up until about day 15 and then I decided to call Simon again on day 15 and go, you're fully right. <laughs> <laughs> Spent 2000 bucks um, on down planning checks, on building and pest checks, on going down there with builders and talking about renos and planning granny flats and then I went, ah, like that's what, like, you know, no matter how educated you are, no matter how good your process is, sometimes emotions come up. Um, always you know, emotions some, come up sometimes like that little bargain that looks like a bargain isn't really a bargain once you get into the detail or, and, or it's a bargain for a reason yeah that's what yeah, i like to say cheap for a reason like, yeah it's because the same doesn't tick the boxes for the market it's the same as a car guys like you know a crap car is a crap car and a good car is a good car it is the exact same with property yeah without a doubt so you appreciate it guys thanks for listening wherever you are and we can't wait to continue to be a part of your life and you know, help you grow as a person, as an investor as well.